All right. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for those of you on the East Coast, and we appreciate you joining us today uh, for the next Decision Lands webcast, this time on the topic of IT strategic planning. I think we've got a pretty good and exciting event for you today, uh, and we are uh, excited to introduce a, a new speaker from the Decision Lands family to you today as we talk about really making your IT strategic planning more dynamic, more flexible, more agile, more adaptive than really it's ever been before. My name is Matt Ipri. I'm part of our marketing and product marketing and product management team here at Decision Lens, and I'll be your host today for the, the remainder of our hour. But it's really my pleasure to briefly introduce our guest today. Uh, we've got the honor of hosting Stephanie Davenport, who's the president and CEO of Prime Strategy, Inc., as our special guest speaker today. I'll let Stephanie introduce herself later in a little more detail. But suffice to say, Stephanie has had lots of experience in IT strategic planning, uh, in strategy and strategic planning in general. She's got a wealth of experience around financial services and other industries and has worked with IT groups all over the place. We've had the pleasure of seeing Stephanie speak uh, at a number of the innovation events we've been to. It's where we met her, and she's really become a great partner of Decision Lens over the last few months, and we're excited to have her here as our guest. So in a few minutes, I'll introduce her, but she'll be walking us through the meat of our content today. Here's what we'll talk about today. Uh, we're going to briefly talk about, you know, why dynamic strategic planning is even coming up at all. You know, why is this a topic we care about or are interested in now? Why do we think this is a topic you should be interested in now? Why are our customers and clients talking about this, asking about this? Uh, we'll briefly talk about that. And Stephanie will take us through uh, some of her experience with making your IT strategic planning more dynamic over time and the keys you can do and, and add and implement to really make it more flexible and dynamic uh, and adaptive at your uh, organization. Uh, so she'll walk us through that. And then we'll talk a little bit how an analytic solution like Decision Lens uh, is a great accelerator and automator for this process for you as well. Uh, and finally, we'll end with some Q&A. So with that sort of in mind, a bit of housekeeping, if you've got questions, uh, we want to hear from you. So please put them into the chat. Uh, you should be able to chat your questions to Maddie Scott, who is the host of our, our session today, and she'll receive those, and we'll, we'll leave time for questions at the end of the event. So throughout today, while I'm speaking or Stephanie is, please send in your chats to Maddie Scott, uh, your questions via chat to Maddie Scott, and we'll get to all of them. Uh, we'll also have some good uh, poll questions for all of you to participate in throughout the event. So look for those, and please give us your answers and your thoughts as they come up as well, because we want this to be a good interactive event. And then finally, to head it off at the pass, the first question I know we'll get is, will we share this content? And the answer is yes. Uh, we'll strip out the things that cannot be shared, but for the most part, we'll show, er, share everything with you as well as a recording of this event for anyone you know who missed it or might be interested uh, by tomorrow or the day after at the latest. So you'll get all that info from us directly here. All right, so with that, let's hop into our, our content today. Really, why is the time right for dynamic IT planning, and why is this a topic that uh, comes up pretty regularly for us around here? Let's start by listening to a, a number of the themes and things we hear from our customers and the organizations we work with rather repeatedly. I think it sets the stage for why uh, looking at your IT strategic planning process and taking a more dynamic, flexible approach to it is important. One of the biggest things we hear repeatedly is that organizations really struggle to have the visibility they need into the activities they're delivering every day and the ongoing activities, projects, and capabilities they have going. And not just knowing what's happening, but more importantly, the strategic value of what it is they're doing. Because then they can make smart decisions around funding and resources around those activities. So that visibility into the true value of those, I think, is what a lot of organizations are missing. Another is that they're very often faced with the need to uh, remove inefficiency from their portfolio. And inefficiency, I mean redundant activities, activities that could serve more organizations than that they are, uh, things that might be outdated, things that might be truly wasted resources. The hard part is, how do I identify those? How do I know which ones of those truly are inefficient to remove those. And you need to be able to map that to value and, and really look at that ongoing and see what's inefficient and what's not. So really to know what to identify and reallocate 
so you can move resources towards transformation and growth is an important goal and it's sometimes hard. And then finally, being able to consistently communicate value across the organization and maybe with your business partners is a challenge we often hear. Uh, what does value really mean? How do these things really align to the business? That way we can have a smart, interactive, you know, collaborative conversation about why something should be moved or reallocated or funded differently or accelerated. Um, when we all understand the same definition of value and can link everything to strategy on an ongoing basis, we can have that conversation consistently. So we hear those themes a lot. Those themes really drive us to improve our strategic planning process uh, and therefore our portfolio decisions. The other thing that's obviously driving all of this is that resources in IT, and by resources I mean budget, people, um, assets if need be, are really constrained. And there's really three drivers that are pushing that constraint and leading, leading organizations to try and be more intelligent and more planned with their, their strategic prioritization. The first is the sort of growing unmet need uh, from our business partners. And, and this is one we can all relate to. Every day, every year, every planning cycle, we get more requests and more uh, needs from our business partners and from groups around the organization. And as we don't answer those every day, which we'll never be able to do, the, the, the gap, the growing need, you know, just continues to accelerate. And, and that, that's, a, that's a problem that leads to our constraint and also hurts our partnership at times. The second one is that overall, and it's the, the sort of industry trend, that um, the IT budget continues to sort of decline, especially on a percentage basis. Uh, and again, that's in forms of money and resources, and that just uh, really exacerbates the problem of, of not meeting the needs uh, of the requests you're getting from across the organization. And the third is that really a lot of IT executives and groups around uh, the IT portfolio are being pushed and being really encouraged to drive more of the funds and resources they're spending in IT to transformation and growth projects and away from simply running, maintaining, and operating. Uh, and that ratio there of running the transforming has really got a lot of attention of IT executives around the, around the world as they try and get away from 80% running and operating, maybe all the way down to only 20% running and operating and 80% transformation. Now, that may, you know, be in the future for a lot of us. That's a goal a lot of people have. How can I push more around transforming and growing the business and not just on running and operating uh, my, my infrastructure and my IT? Those problems are really, you know, causing our constraints to be really more front of mind than they ever have been before. And what this ends up doing, to sort of bring it home a little bit, is it ends up being a drag on the business. Uh, our resources aren't perfectly aligned to our strategy because we're sort of fighting with operating and running and maybe answering some old unmet needs. We can't modernize as much as we'd like. We certainly can't fund all the requests uh, that we're getting from our business partners. Um, quite often we are dealing with uh, silos of requests, meaning if I uh, have received requests from multiple business units, they may be actually be asking for slightly similar things but expect different resources and different deliveries, which can lead to problems in redundancy and efficiency. Um, my systems of record continue to be a problem, especially on the portfolio side. Uh, my process is very primitive which, which, uh, and often very manual, which holds me back from being as reactive and flexible as I can be. And then, of course, my costs are too high, and I have the wrong accountability across my organization in IT and our business partners outside as well. You know, how can I be sure we're all driving towards the same strategy and the same level of communication and around our strategy to make the right expectations about our resources? So that's sort of how these things then tend to bubble up. Uh, and really what we're driving at, what we're going to talk about today, is that your planning must be dynamic and flexible. And, you know, the picture on the bottom is very illustrative, and it's a little cartoonish even of sorts, but if you think about it, when you, when you go with a single annual planning cycle, you then are going to take that strategy or that plan and sort of bullet through the year, bulldoze it straight through the year no matter what happens. You know, any shift in competition, any shift in competitive strategy, any new product uh, strategy you want to implement, you know, bulldozing your strategy from earlier in the year uh, may not be the right course of action where you need to be able to readdress and say, hey, my priorities may have shifted because of this influence. I need to therefore then shift my portfolio, my priorities coming out of it. So again, it's cartoonish, but that idea that you need to dynamically look at your plan throughout the year uh, to make sure you are prepared and reactive really is what, um, what we can do to, to, to improve that. So that's what we're going to talk about today. 
Um, and it's with that that I'm ready to move to the next section and ready to introduce um, our, our guest speaker for today, and that's Stephanie Davenport. So without any further ado, Stephanie, the, the floor is yours, so please introduce yourself and, and take us through the next few sections. Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. Let me know if you're hearing me okay. Yep. Okay, great. You can move on to the next slide. Before I lounge in here to talk more about this dynamic planning approach, what it is, what it means, let me tell you a little bit about Prime Strategy. I'm Stephanie Davenport, President and Founder of Prime Strategy, and what we do is serve as a partner to companies, providing end-to-end -end strategy management services that help you get better strategy formulation, smarter execution, and better results. And this comes from having lived, breathed, and navigated through um, a planning function and performance around IT and helping other companies get beyond where they are today. Uh, we have a specialty in helping companies bridge the whole world of business strategy versus IT strategy, how to be in more alignment, how to get technology leaders out front, leading in business strategy so that we draw optimal value for the investment spend of the technology initiatives. We provide C-suite level coaching and coaching to senior business leaders, providing them objective and candid feedback, um, the kind that they need but don't often get. Uh, and we help your organizations build what we're calling a strategic agility muscle so that your business can adapt and evolve. Uh, move on to the next slide, please. When we talk about strategic agility, I want to first off just be on the same page about what it is and what it is not. What are some of the key drivers for it? What it looks like? And then some key enablers of strategic agility. First of all, let's clear the air. Strategic agility is not this linear, lengthy annual planning process that really does spend much of the year, thereby qualifying as continuous planning, just not in the right way. And some of you might um, recognize what I'm referring to in this. What we will spend time on today is talking about what strategic agility is. And it's simply the ability to continuously adjust and adapt strategic direction in a dynamic environment. There are a lot of moving parts in the environment. And one of the pictures I brought up to sort of, sort of show this is a picture of a cheetah. Uh, it's no secret that the pace of change around the world is at unprecedented levels rapid advances in technology, environmental changes, political landscape changes, regulatory changes, you name it. Your company's ability to anticipate and respond to the change in a dynamic fashion can determine whether your company is disruptor or disrupted, or in other words, whether you are a predator or prey. I want you to make a mental note today on how you might rate your company's level of strategic agility or your organization if you're running one. Consider the level of agility needed to take the lead in your industry or at least remain relevant. Ask yourself the question, does your level of strategic agility keep your competitors awake at night? The, the correlation I want to draw to the cheetah is, you know, the cheetah is arguably the fastest animal in the world. Uh, it can go from zero to 70 miles an hour in about 10 seconds. And unlike most other large animals, they don't use brute force or um, stalking abilities on prey. They overwhelm their prey by the sheer speed of attack. When you think about the ability to shift direction or to um, respond to an environmental event, what does it take for your company to make that turn? What's your strategic posture? Are you posturing as a disruptor or a dis disruptee? Keep this in mind as we continue to talk about this notion of strategic agility. If you go to the next slide, what exactly is a disruptor? And I pulled out a few common ones just to get an immediate response and reaction from you. By the very nature of the term, a disruptor is a company that creates ripples within an industry. If you're seeing some of the logos we've got here, think about what they've done uh, or how they've changed our lives. What did we do before these companies? Does anybody remember Blockbuster, Borders, Kodak, Polaroid? What, do we see? what jumps out 
to us about some of the companies now we're seeing on the screen. What did they do? They made life simpler for us. They seized opportunities to improve upon old business models. They clearly obsessed over the customer experience, solving some common pain points. They had their eyes wide open to innovative ways to leverage advances in technology, and they are delivering value at a price point that causes a massive exodus, exodus of the old. They're asking the right questions. They're gathering the relevant insights, and they have the guts to make the right decisions. They were creative. They were successful in creatively solving for consumer and business needs, sometimes even before the consumer recognized they had a need. The interesting thing, though, is that much of the impact we've experienced from these companies and their solutions has occurred within the last 10 to 15 years. And it's projected that in the next 15 to 20 years, the world will still look a lot different than it does now. At the pace your company currently acknowledges and responds to changing needs, will your company still exist? Will it be a relevant factor? Will you be a front runner or stuck in the game of catch up? How much longer will you be able to sustain the business as you are today? We can go to the next slide. One of the things I wanted to call out, what's driving the need for this notion of ability, uh, uh, strategic agility? And these are just a few, and I'll go through some of them just to drive the point home. And some of them you're probably thinking about now if you're in either an annual planning process or you've got some dynamic um, aspect of your planning. So there's no secret, faster and faster pace of change, record pace of technology progress, intensifying customer need for convenience at lower than traditional cost, the need for increased operational efficiencies while delivering a modern customer experience. That's a challenge. The rise of this sharing economy for some of you in the hospitality industry, the power of innovation that's happening across the world to impact and disrupt what's happening in the U.S., and this is because some of the other countries don't have as much regulation as we do, but we're seeing some of the benefits they're having from innovation. When will that start to impact the U.S. market? We want to be ready for that. In the medical field, the rise in medical sensor data available from wearable technology, not to medical companies, but to technology companies. The decreasing cost of human genome sequencing, Dropping prices of solar energy, what do these things do? How do we need to be thinking about these things today? And in all our planning, are we factoring in not only the here and now, but how we're going to respond when others tap into these drivers and start to move with solutions for them? The changing global political landscape, not to mention just in the U.S. Uncertainty in general, brand loyalty becoming extinct. It's about what have you done for me lately? The profile, the profile of the millennial generation. And then last but not least, a driver for agility has to do with your organization's pace of strategy execution. Is it not meeting the pace of change in the environment? Is it not meeting the pace of your competitors? Those are just some key drivers for why you need to be in a position of strategic agility. And when you think about strategic agility in business, it's almost in parallel to how you would think about if any of you on the line uh, are any adult volleyball leagues or football league or soccer league or whatever the case might be, tennis, it's about agility in some of those. You don't know sometimes uh, what your opponent is going to do, but you are watching your opponent and you're ready for the next move. You're ready for, you know, the, the, the next serve or whatever the case might be. Same thing in business. Um, you need to be ready for what you don't know is coming, but get on the proactive with some of these drives and start to deal with them. Uh, moving on to the next slide, strategic agility. How do we leverage it? Once we get it or get some degree of it, what do we use it for? Use it for proactive innovation. Use it to address competitive threats that are coming from non-players in the market um, or even your peer competitors that you're generally watching yourself against. Sometimes it comes into play when there's a catastrophic event. Let's say there was a tsunami. Let's say there was something that affected a number of businesses. Your ability to bounce back and the speed at which you do that can determine a lot for your company. And then you might want to just exercise some strategic agility relative to what you're seeing in the pace of execution of your current strategies. If they are not going fast enough to get you where you want to go, 
you want to regularly be looking at that and readjusting your course of action. You can move on to the next slide. So what does strategic agility look like? The short answer is iterative strategic management. In today's world, strategy formulation is, and execution, well, let's, let's go on. Let me tell you what the first five things are first before I go into any depth. The five key enablers. Number one, I'm calling out has to do with your strategy engagement model. We'll get into each one of these. An ongoing cycle of environmental scan is needed. Recurring strategic dialogue needs to be happening. Think about whether any of these are happening in your organization. You absolutely require a flexible resource allocation process and the tools that help you get there. And you need to be thinking about um, building leadership agility in your organization. Next slide. Deep dive now into the strategy engagement model. In today's world, strategy formulation and execution is inherent in every leader's job. If you're on the line, you probably have some of those responsibilities as well. I would say that with a focus on innovation through all ranks of an organization, that strategy has become an aspect of everyone's job. You'll want to give thought to an engagement model that enables ongoing, open, cross-group dialogue. This will allow for the needed shift from a focus on strategic planning to a focus on strategic thinking all throughout your organization. And the notion about strategic thinking is that strategic planning has a start and an end, typically, but strategic thinking never ends. And that's what you want happening in your organization at all times. Um, let's move on to the next slide. You want to, the the poll, you want to run the poll here, Stephanie, before you go to the next one? Absolutely, yes. Let me just describe this a little bit to the audience. What we wanted to do through this um, discussion is on each of these key enablers, give you an opportunity to digest what we're saying by thinking about what is the biggest pain point relative to each of these enablers that you're seeing in your organization. So the first one is around this strategy engagement model. Um, if you could quickly uh, select which one best represents the biggest pain point in your environment, that would be helpful. And what we'll do once we get these responses, it's optional. You don't have to participate, but we would love for you to. For those who participate, we'll share the results with you in summary because sometimes it's good to see what challenges are other organizations having, how might they be dealing with them, and maybe there's an opportunity in the future for us to come back with some best practices about how people are actually dealing with these things. So this helps us um, where we are today and helps you understand what we mean by this strategy engagement model. Where might there be um, issues in your organization in dealing with that? Okay. Yeah, we've got about 20 some people in. I'll give people like two more seconds and then we'll, we'll close this one and look at what we're hearing from some of the attendees. Yeah, and let me just describe why you're doing that. Um, strategic thinking, if you, promoting that in your environment uh, will be a big win because strategic thinking engages parts of the brain in synthesizing and analyzing. It uses intuition, creativity, what if questioning, you know, to get different perspectives rather than a focus on a planning process. Move closer and closer to getting strategic thinking happening in your organization. And there are ways to do that. Um, if you need some ideas around that, we can certainly have a deeper dialogue on that on another time. But that is really the key to the engagement model, tapping into those folks, not necessarily just your senior exec executives when it comes to strategic planning, but engaging different players in the planning process who have different perspectives to help drive your company to a different place. So how are we doing out there, Matt? So I, so I shared the, the results to sort of cut off a bit. You can see that a large percentage there are, the largest percentage there is around the IT treaty planning process focuses mainly on project estimating. Okay. Okay. I suspected it right. would end up there. Okay. All right. I'll slide you on. Okay. Second enabler. Next slide. Ongoing, an ongoing cycle of environmental scans is absolutely crucial. Um, 
And it depends on where your company has decided to be from a strategic posturing standpoint. Is your company a follower in a follower position, or is it in a leading position, or is it in some place in between in terms of where they want to be? Because where you've decided to stand will determine the level of rigor you give to ongoing environmental scans, whether that's internal scans is what's happening or not happening with your company or what's happening on the external arena. Um, funding for many companies tends to be the issue when it comes to the ongoing cycle scans, but the notion about scans I want to draw out today is that you've got to scan probably with different sources or resources than you have in the past. And I don't knock some of the big um, research companies like the Gartners of the World or others. They provide a great deal of insight to organizations looking uh, to drive change and different strategies in their organizations. But sometimes you're going to have to think about some newer sources that give you an opportunity to see what capability exists before others have already grabbed onto it. So it's looking for some new sources. It's a regular opportunity, to, whether it's quarterly, uh, semi-annual or annual, you want to have an, uh, an increased cycle of environmental scans in terms of what's going on in your industry. Um, some do it daily. Some do it weekly. Some do it monthly. Some may skip a year and not do it, and that's the most dangerous place to be in because you don't know what you don't know at that point in time. The only way to find out is to begin seeking it out. And so relative to ongoing environmental scans, Give some sense of what might be big pain points in terms of your organization being able to do that. And by your organization, you may have a unit that you're responsible for and you need a sense of what's happening that can impact how you support the overall organization or you might be running an overall company. Um, what's your biggest top of mind pain point? Is it the need for uh, new resources other than what you have today? Is it inadequate funding levels? Is it a lack of the resources within your company to do the scans and then analyze what that means to your company? Uh, do you have an inadequate frequency um, for your target strategic position? So if you want to be a front runner but you're not doing regular scans, does that, does that melt with where you need to be? Or is it all of the above? Or you have something else that's a big challenge there? All right. So you can see it's relatively even split with some you know, leaders around the inadequate frequency for uh, that, uh, that you talked about. Okay. People are feeling they're not scanning enough in terms of where they want to be competitively. And so you want to give some thought to that. And sometimes the sources are not necessarily as expensive as, as traditional sources. And so you want to be open to opportunities to tap into that. Okay. Moving on. Recurring strategic dialogue. Um, what I want to say about that is it, it's not enough to have that dialogue once a year. What you want to be doing throughout the year is having this ongoing cycle of assessing progress against your strategy, um, assessment of your pace of execution relative to the committed outcomes. Um, driving some effective decision-making in your organization relative to continuing or stopping initiatives based on changes in the external environment, changes in the internal environment. Internal environment changes could be you didn't have enough resources at the right time to move forward. Changes could be funding has gotten cut. Now what do we do? We need more strategic dialogue, not just a going back and forth of what do I cut. How do you look at the different alternative scenarios? Do you have the tools before you to provide input into that decision-making to say, what are the right things to start, stop, continue in your organization? When I talk about strategic dialogue, it's not saying um, if you're in an organization where you're responsible for bringing uh, leaders together to talk about strategy. It's not just the scheduling of the session and the agenda that I'm referring to here. What I'm referring to here is designing strategic dialogue effectively so that it generates breakthrough results. And to do that, you've got to understand your environment. You've got to understand the players in your environment and where they are. And sometimes you need to um, prompt some of that discussion before a bigger discussion. You want this kind of strategic dialogue to occur on fertile ground, so to speak. And so there is an art 
to designing these strategic conversations. And one of the things I share with people is there's a book out there that talks about the moments of impact. It's called How to Design Strategic Conversations that Accelerate Change. And that's what we need more of uh, in today's environment to drive, especially in larger organizations, some broader thinking uh, about the what if, what might be possible. Um, we've got up on the screen right now, relative to strategic dialogue in your organization, what's the biggest top of mind challenge? What we want to be doing is having real strategy uh, discussion going on, real dialogue that gets you to a different place. And some companies can do that on a regular basis. Some companies do that once every three years. It's just not enough to do it once a year. That's the point we want to get across here. So you want some sort of recurring cycle of strategic dialogue in your company if it isn't happening organically already. What's your biggest pain point around that? Um, is strategy in your organization limited to just the annual planning cycle? Um, is the conversation too tactical? Uh, do you get enough view of strategic trade-offs and alternatives in your discussions? Or are you in a race against the schedule to eke out a strategy that now can be presented to your executive team? Is it all of the above? Is it something else? What's the challenge here that you know you'll have to deal with in your organization to drive better strategic dialogue? Looks like and a better the, view of alternative. I'm sorry. Yeah, it looks like definitely the majority is around the the dialogue planting too tactical and not quite strategic enough. Okay, that's not surprising, but there is hope. <laughs> Always is. All right, moving on. Fourth enabler: something around a flexible resource allocation model. Um, you want business case flexibility. You want to consider a mix of short and long-term objectives when you're evaluating opportunities. You want to be uh, willing to make the hard decision to continue or stop or start something new where you need to. Um, do you have modernized or more efficient prioritization and decision-making tools in your organization? Um, do you have the ability to reallocate resources across units? A couple of things come into play here. One, it has to do a lot with the tools that you're leveraging to bring this information forward. And secondly, it has to do with the uh, decision making in your organization to want to reallocate resources. But many of you in the technology world who um, surface the data that support these types of decisions are probably working with some tools that are not as modern as you'd like them to be and don't allow for dynamic decision making in your organization when it comes to needing to reallocate um, funding, reallocate people across the organization to go into the areas of more strategic priority for your company. Um, the approaches many have today are still fairly labor intensive. Many of it is driven by um, Excel, PowerPoint presentations, and not enough by dynamic tools that say in this meeting we can, we can make those decisions and give you alternative scenarios to do that. Um, so flexibility and resource allocation is critical. How are you doing that today? What are your top of mind pain points around this? Is it labor intensive? Does it lack commitment um, for reallocation, reallocating resources in your organization? Is it both of those? Is it something else? Think about what you need to address for resource allocation in your organization. The more efficiently and quickly you can do that when responding, to the need for different strategy, the better off you are. Pretty spread around this one. Uh, the majority of response, though, are, are on that lack of commitment or effective processing for reallocating resources. Okay. Moving on to the next one, and the last one, but not least, is the level of leadership agility that you have yourself but also the level of leadership agility that your organization has. And what I'm really referring to here is the ability to lead well in a variety of circumstances, especially new and changing, ambiguous situations. These leaders question the status quo. And if you think about the companies that we saw earlier that were disruptors, um, thinking about doing things in new ways, 
How would we do things differently? What might it look like 10 to 15 years down the road? I know a number of organizations are wrestling with just how to get through the end of 2016, much less what's happening five to 10 years down the road. But it's absolutely crucial that as you um, execute on your strategies today, you're thinking about the agility needed um, for what's occurring in the environment because others are thinking of the what if scenarios. Um, leadership agility is being touted as one of the most important leadership competencies today among leaders. There's not enough of it. On the other hand, what we're finding is that a number of companies do not have a focus on leadership agility in their leadership development programs. So that's a key area of focus. And sometimes as leaders, you have to reach out and get the development on your own. But if you can influence where your company is, relative to developing agile leaders, that will go a long way towards some of the other enablers we talked about, having your leaders be open to them and creating that fertile ground so that your company can be one of the disruptors instead of a disruptee. Looks like the biggest amount of response is around the awareness in the organization of the impact of agility. Okay, that's key. So there needs to be a higher level of awareness around leadership agility in the organization. And, it, and leadership agility will help in a number of ways in the organization. And so that's a great thing to be focused on. What we wanted to do is just give you five key things to be thinking about and be focused on as you think about how your organization can move toward a more dynamic strategic approach versus the static or the annual view from that standpoint. Next slide is summarizing what we've talked about so far. So what do you need? You need strategic thinking at all levels in your organization. We talked about a better engagement model. You need new ways of probing the environment. You need real strategic dialogue. And you need a flexible resource allocation approach, process, tools. You need a strong leadership agility um, focus in your organization as well. Let's move on to the next one. So strategic agility sounds easier said than done, and it is. Uh, but some things you want to consider when you're thinking about what we've talked about today relative to your organization, getting from static to dynamic. Think about the level of change required in your organization to get there, and whether or not it makes sense to start transitioning there step by step with your process this year versus needing to have a big bang approach, which is determined by your company's target competitive position. So I heard some say earlier that scans are not on a frequent enough basis for where we want to be competitively. You've got to address it, and some of that you can use as your um, arsenal tool, what do you have for influencing your organization to think about this a little more. In your planning this year, think about this and what it would take for your organization to get there. What could you accomplish this year toward that goal? And if you built a roadmap for getting from where you are from static today to truly dynamic, what would that roadmap look like? One way to start getting there is to assess what kind of tools are you using today? Are they stifling the organization? Are they causing your, pro your process to be lengthy? Can you get the kind of information you need in a dynamic environment readily available at the fingertips of your decision makers? What could you do today to start moving in that direction? Next slide. Oh, that's the end of my presentation. But that leads into um, more of what Matt was saying around the tool, around decision lens. And one of the beauties in that tool is that it gives you the ability in this investment prioritization and planning cycle to look at different scenarios in a dynamic fashion versus it takes two or three weeks to pull together the whole portfolio view to get uh, executives to make a decision on. You can begin to show some of those different scenarios in those meetings without having your teams go back and spend another two or three weeks to get an alternative scenario available to the decision makers. The quicker the information is available at the fingertips of your leaders, the quicker they can make the right decisions relative to your strategic direction or positioning in your organization, in your markets, and in the industry. 
I believe we have questions next. Yeah, I, I, we will in a few minutes. If you've got questions now, keep sending them in. We've got a bunch coming in, and we want to keep uh, collecting them. So make sure you chat those over to Maddie Scott, and we'll keep collecting them, and we'll cover them in just a few minutes, Stephanie. Stephanie, I really appreciate it. I think um, they're, they're really, really powerful insights there for the right way to, um, to, to, to identify the problems that are actually in the organization there and find ways to, to move past them. And I, and I think I was really taken in a couple ways by some of the poll results, uh, the fact that a lot of the planning right now or the thinking right now slants to tactical and not strategic enough. Um, and there's not a lot of really attention paid to the, to the need for agility or the need for leaders to have that kind of strategic agility. Um, so those things really are, are, are powerful to hear and are, are not surprising to hear in a lot of ways. And what I want to do for our final really only about five, ten minutes here before we hop into to questions and wrap up today is chat briefly about one of the things that decisions can help you do on this path to more dynamic and strategic portfolio planning. And real quick, for those of you who, who we haven't met before or talked with before, Decision Lens is a software analytic tool for you. You know, it is enterprise software. That it really enables you to prioritize your highest value projects and identify and reallocate those that are inefficient. So it's all about really linking your strategy, linking your strategic direction to your resources, to your projects, to your capabilities, uh, and then making sure you have the visibility into knowing, okay, what's most important right now? What can be reallocated right now? And that's the focus of the software there. And so I want to show you a bit, a bit of that. Just to make clear sort of where uh, these tools around strategic portfolio management sit like Decision Lens, and there are, there are others out there, um, these aren't meant to replace your existing project management suite, your operational uh, project management tools that are there, your PPM tools. What strategic portfolio management software is all about is selecting the right projects selecting the right place to put your resources and your money based on your strategic direction and where your business is going. Uh, ad adding analytics to the problem of alignment and adding analytics to, the, to, to scenario planning and, and long-term planning and multi-year planning to really make sure you have a top-down iterative view of why you're spending what and where your resources are going as opposed to your powerful project management tools which really focus on, okay, am I progressing right now correctly? Am I moving towards milestones? Am I scheduled correctly? Uh, are these things lined up well? That's, that's a key distinction I want to make sure we, we make throughout this process. And really what strategic IT prioritization looks like and specifically the decision lens is the overall process of IT portfolio management. These steps you see in front of you are things you are doing now whether you sort of know it or not, or whether it's a map process or not. You're doing something to collect business cases and ideas and programs around what could be in the portfolio. You're putting some kind of selection strategy in place, uh, whether it's strategically aligned or automated or not. You're doing some kind of analysis to, to select what to do and in what order to do it and what year to do it. And then you're tracking over time to see what's really there. And it's automating those and making those more intelligent and making it more iterative and adaptive that we really strive to do uh, with the Decision Lens software. The four things I really want to show you today, and I'm going to hop into the software and just show you some screens and analytics very briefly, is all about making dynamic strategic planning a reality uh, with analytic software. So on top of the number of different sort of uh, process changes you might make, there are powerful um, software solutions out there that, that make it easy and possible. So I want to hop real quick over into the software. So if you'll excuse my flipping around at the moment. All right. So this is some of the signing and out of the decision on software. This is the you know, exact look of the software you'd have there, and you would build out the, um, you know, the different portfolios you're talking about here. And the first thing I really want to show you is all around that, that step of setting your priorities. And why this matters to the conversation now is that, yeah, on an annual basis, you want to process and you'll, you'll set some good priorities, but the real key is are you, are you readdressing those? Are you looking at those? over time uh, to make sure they're still appropriate and they're still where we're heading. So the process you use to set them, we won't get into that today, but you know, if you look at the, one of the first outputs of Decision Lens is your view of your priorities that are there uh, and, and how the, the criteria you use to select uh, portfolio elements. And this is what you came down to. 
The idea of using software that, that stores this and creates as a system of record is you can come back to this on a regular basis with your business partners and say, hey, is this still the way we want to make selections on where our resources go? Do we still value alignment with corporate strategy over competitive impact and project risk profile? If not, should we re-engage the stakeholders and move on this? Because it's this, it's this prioritization profile, basically, this selection criteria that we use to drive uh, where our resources go. So that first step is reassessing this uh, throughout the year and then making adjustments as you see fit. Second big step is, all right, okay, now you're now applying that criteria model or that selection model to my set of actual projects and capabilities here. Um, so this is a step where you'll, you'll basically look at your existing portfolio there on the right side, and you can see that every one of those now is now mapped to that exact same strategic uh, priorities model I just showed you on the left. And you can see, you know, how these things all align. So this is the initial alignment, but now it's to check throughout the year. Okay, we just changed our relative priorities and our portfolio value model. How does it affect our, um, our, our, per, per, our projects or our capabilities? And something may have changed. Maybe you've decided that project risk profile is a lot more important right now because of what's happening in the, in the world. And say, so, okay, if, if that goes up to 50%, here's how my portfolio changed. My top project didn't really change, but others went way up, and you can see the changes in ranks. The idea is, as your priorities may change, you can on the fly and in process, iteratively throughout the year, see how your priorities really change and are affected there. So that's an important, uh, important ongoing uh, analytic to look at. Another one is really assessing where trade-offs may be. So you're going to move on the process, and you're eventually going to uh, look at all the things that you can fund and, and not fund, and, and that's often based on a value equation. Uh, and so the, this graphic, as it pulls up, is a graphical view of value, you know, comparing the value that each of your products on the table deliver, that's the green bar, with their cost in terms of people or resources or money. And there are different views. You know, you can see, hey, if I could do everything, you know, I would show that all of my, these orange dots here, so I funded them all, and I would get 100% of my portfolio value. But realistically, I can only fund so many. With the resources I've got, I can only fund what looks like about 81% here, and you'll see the ones I lose. I lose the, the lowest uh, uh, value ones and a few others that are a little higher up. I funded all that I could do. But what's interesting is that there are times throughout the year when you have to make trade-offs. When someone demands that you fund a product or a project or capability that may be very low value. So in this example, I funded the lowest priority one here, and you see that we lost some of those up higher on. So that's the exact trade-off now you can take to that business leader and say, hey, this is what we gave up to fund that project that was so important that you, you fund there. And then the final thing I want to show you is looking at all those three things I just talked about sort of side by side, and that final analytic of really looking at scenarios in a side by side manner, you know, because this is where the rubber hits the road. This is where you really find out, am I doing the things I need to be delivering? So the same three scenarios I just showed you, if I could do everything, uh, if I could only allocate what I've got money for, or if someone forced me to fund that one project that may be low value, and, and you can see the differences. You can start to see where the differences lie, uh, what criteria is being served more than the other, and then you can dive into where resources go, what categories are being served, uh, and different metrics and those analytics as it goes. So I know it was pretty brief, but the, the, the key point I wanted to make there, um, and, and I'll go back to showing that on, on the slide, is that in reality what it comes down to is that there are ways to add analytics and make sure your analytics are supporting your move to more strategic planning and this more adaptive and flexible and dynamic strategic planning. Uh, and there are four easy ways to sort of make that possible. That's what I wanted to show you there briefly. All right, so with that, I want to move on and answer some of the questions that you all had for, for Stephanie and for myself. Uh, you'll see on the screen just a bit of a plug sort of to learn more, uh, learn more about Decision Lens, learn more about Prime Strategy Inc., and then see more of the software in action uh, on uh, the number of demo videos that are out there on the Decision Lens YouTube channel. Um, but I wanted to go through it, so go ahead and unmute Stephanie's, or unmute Stephanie's line. You'll hear her again. Stephanie, we've got a number of questions in, uh, and I'm going to rattle through them as quickly as I can here, and then we'll, we'll pick some out that make sense for you. 
There's a really good one that came from someone in our audience there about, and I'm going to paraphrase it a bit because it's a bit long. Are there concerns or not concerns or impacts or not impacts related to being too agile or too flexible, too adaptive? You know, meaning are we vacillating or the loss of continuity and resources? Are we affecting overall throughput and costs? Stephanie, did you have a uh, opinion on that? My opinion is I don't think you can ever be too agile for where you want to go. So you're setting some strategic point or competitive position in terms of where you want to be. You're always keeping your eyes on that, but you're responding to things along the way or being proactive or offensive, what I might say, in terms of strategy of getting there relative to what's happening in your environment, whether that's in your company or whether that's externally. So I don't think you can get too agile for where you want to be. Does that make sense? It does, and, and, and I agree. I mean, I, I think what you do is when you add the right sort of uh, data and analytics to it, you, you almost ensure you're not undoing yourself. So by reassessing your uh, strategic alignment to your resources throughout the year, you are not being overly agile for an unnecessary reason. When you make a change in a resource, it's because, look, we had a shift and you can see the impact. Here's the product that's going to change. Here are the resources that are going to move, and you can be prepared for exactly what's happening. Uh, the, funny, the analogy he used in the question was, if you start to take Vienna, take Vienna. And, and you're right about that, unless the something in the middle changes and Vienna becomes a lot less important than taking Budapest. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real problem. That's why I think you want to add data and analytics to it to keep yourself honest and make sure uh, they are uh, make sure you're, you're looking at the right things and, and valuing the right things. Right. Um, right. And go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say to that the other part of that is that staying focused on where you want to go is the key. And sometimes that's difficult in large organizations. Sometimes the technology organization doesn't have a clear picture of where its business partners want to go, but you've got to press in there to make sure you have a view of that, the same view that your business partners have. If there are business partners on the line, you have to make sure your technology people are engaged in that as well. And so the analytics are useful to both the business and the technology side to get to whatever that destination is. Even if it changes, you both want to be in lockstep about where that is, and then you adjust agility where you need to build it, strengthen it in different areas to get there. You got it. Another question that came in, Stephanie, and again, I might paraphrase a bit a little long. How can business analysis overcome political pressure to allocate the portfolio according to organizational silos? Is this a problem of strategy or just leadership needing to be more courageous? Um, I, I'm going to answer that with the simplest answer. Decisions are being made on information being put before senior leaders. The better we can get at that information, um, the better we can get those decisions to go where we need to be. As senior leaders in either technology or business, you have a role to influence decisions, influence strategy, influence prioritization decisions. Focus on that soft stuff as you also deliver the analytics, because sometimes those who scream the loudest first get the fun. Um, you want to make sure you're doing the right thing for your company to make the right decision for where it has said it wants to be. And information is key to doing that. I don't know if I'm yeah. getting at the question that the person asked. Is yeah, more and I think that? Yeah, I think, think that's exactly right. And, and collaboration is important, too. You know, it is a political minefield at times. And so being sure the right people are involved, the right stakeholders are involved as you're building the, you know, decision-making criteria model, as you're setting your priorities, uh, when they're involved in the priority setting, they have very little objection to where it ends up because they saw the process, they participated in the process, their opinion is part of the process, their data was part of the process, and you really can uh, let, the, let a truly collaborative, involved process with all the different silos, uh, and then when you add data analytics to it, uh, remove a lot, of that, a lot of that pushback, which I think is, uh, is important. All right, I've got time, I think, for one final one, and then for all those that we didn't get to, I apologize. We'll, we'll, we will send out some answers via email as appropriate. Stephanie, do you see planners, uh, especially within IT, as a full-time role? Are, are many organizations going that way? Is it still sort of a side job of, of a PMO organization or of the CIO office 
What do you see with the role and where, where the ownership is lying? I think it's different for different companies, but what I, where I see it moving more toward is this notion of strategic thinking. If you think about what's happening in organization with the rise of the chief innovation officer, what it's really trying to do is to get every employee, every member of a company thinking strategically for that company, whether it's doing things differently internally, whether it's, whether it's getting out in the forefront and doing something no one's done before, they're drawing on the knowledge of all those in the organization from a strategy standpoint. Strategy is moving from a process to more of a way of being. It's the new norm in terms of strategic thinking. The closer you can get to that, the more better positioned you are to have the kind of agility needed in the kind of environment we're in today. And the better you can have dynamic, a uh, dynamic aspect of planning, um, Planning is becoming a bad word in a lot of organizations. Um, a lot of organizations feel like they do nothing but plan, uh, that they can't execute, that um, you know, they can't get the funding to support all the planning that they did. It's becoming more dynamic, um, faster in some companies than others, but that's where it's headed. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. I, I think you're right. I mean, we're seeing a lot of the same thing there. You know, the, the roles are sort of come and go. The ownership of the governance and the ownership of the process of where these decisions are being made, it's, it's really the most important to make sure the right people involved and the right sort of data is being sought across the board. All right. Well, we are right at 1 o'clock, and so we do not need to keep anyone longer uh, than we need to. Uh, we really appreciate all of you joining us today for participating in the polls, for submitting uh, questions. Um, Stephanie, we thank you on behalf of Decision Lens for giving us your insight and your expertise today. Uh, we will definitely send out to all of you the recording and the details of the next few days. We hope you uh, send things to some of your colleagues or those who couldn't make it. And we look forward to interacting with more of you soon. Thanks so much and have a great day. Thank you.